All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I am not an MPH alum. I want to share I am a proud alum of the Master's in Clinical Research Program. So 20 years ago, I was also a dual professional student between my residency and fellowship and was fortunate to be a student of Dr. St. George, Dr. Amber, Dr. Langenberg, Dr. Magder, and many more. So I can attest to the excellence of the faculty in this department and in this program. And I am so grateful for that opportunity to learn from them and want to recognize how that education has strengthened and informed my career as an academic gastroenterologist and in academic medicine. I am truly delighted to be joining you as we celebrate both the 20th anniversary of the School of Medicine's MPH program and the 10th anniversary of the Rene Royak Shaler Lecture in Health Equity. Both programs have served as models, paving the way for ongoing and evolving equity initiatives at UMB and within the School of Medicine. Dr. Landetta Jones and Tim Dr. Tim O'Connor have served as interim co-directors of the program in health equity and population health since August of 2022. Under their leadership, the program has grown to over 300 members across disciplines and schools on the UMB campus, as well as across additional academic institutions in Baltimore City, the state of Maryland, and around the country. Their think tanks are busy working on issues in mental health and addiction, infectious disease, and maternal and child health. Most recently, they added two popular new working groups, community-engaged research and foundational science and health equity research, which is also hosting a book club. Dr. O'Connor is a former Gates Cambridge scholar and associate professor in the Institute for Genome Sciences, where his lab takes an interdisciplinary approach to using large data sets to solve complex biological problems through next generation sequencing. Dr. Landetta Jones is Associate Professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. She has created safe spaces for dialogue on combining the expertise of researchers with the wisdom and lived experiences of the community to co-generate context-specific and comprehensive solutions for advancing health equity. It is my distinct honor to introduce both of these impressive faculty members to you and officially announce their new well-deserved titles, no longer as interim, but official co-directors of the program in health equity and population health. Landetta and Tim, thank you for your work and for inspiring faculty from all over UMB and beyond to design and conduct community partnered research in health equity. I now turn it over to you to introduce today's distinguished speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce um, or to, to co-introduce our speaker today. Um, we're talking about how we're gonna split things up, but <laughs> so uh, Rakai Yearby um, is a is the inaugural Kara J. Trotter, Trot Professor in Law at the Mortz College of Law, Professor in the Department of Health Services, Management and Policy at the College of Public Health, and a faculty affiliate of the Kirwan Institute at The Ohio State University. Uh, she earned her bachelor's degree in honors, uh, with honors in biology from the University of Michigan. Um, her MPH from John Hopkins School of Public Health and her JD from Georgetown University Law Center. Um, she worked at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services as an assistant regional counsel and served as a law clerk for the Honorable Ann Claire Williams of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. And I'd like to add that over the course of the last couple of days, it's just been really fun to get to know you. And we've had some wonderful dialogue from basic science all the way to policy and just learning from each other. And it's, she's just a fantastic individual and I'm excited for you to hear from you. Yes, thank you. And I would agree, your enthusiasm for the basic science is infectious. And I did want to recruit you to our PhD program. <laughs> but 
Um, today, we're delighted to hear about her talk entitled Transforming Public Health to Achieve Health Justice. Uh, she's going to unpack a lot of different uh, concepts, particularly structural discrimination and how policy and law uh, are just some of the tools used to create these differential conditions by structuring systems in racially discriminatory way. And then finally, she's going to um, provide some uh, uh, talk about how we can ad adopt the health justice framework um, as, as, as an approach to reform. So without further ado, welcome, Dr. Rakaya Yerby. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. And I'm just going to set up my iPad that has my notes. Um, I do want to say that it is an inspiration to hear um, about the work of Renee, to thank you to the family. This is so exciting to have this opportunity to speak with you about the work that I have been doing, trying to connect all of the different fields that I'm interested in. But today I'm not going to talk about my love of genetics, um, but I am going to talk about uh, public health. And um, when I think about transforming public health, I think about uh, this wonderful picture. Sorry, I'm just starting my timer um, so that we will hopefully have some time for questions. So I think about um, this picture that represents all the groups of people we're trying to help, right? It includes people from different religious backgrounds, individuals with disability, uh, race, sexual orientation, gender orientation, uh, and we really are trying to help them thrive. We must transform public health though, so that we specifically co connect public health to eliminating the discrimination that keeps these people from being able to thrive. And we must do so specifically connecting discrimination to the social determinants of health, as well as the social drivers of health. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And in particular, the ways that we can work together to achieve achieve health justice. And so I'm going to go through sort of this discussion of the revised social determinants of health model that I created, uh, define for you structural discrimination and intersectionality, use structural racism and law as an example, and then get into the specifics of a particular system and finish on a hopeful note of health justice. And before I do, I want to apologize. Um, recently, I was at a conference on uh, health disparities in individuals with disabilities. So I want to step back and just identify myself uh, for those of you who have accessibility issues. So I'm a Black woman with long uh, braids. I have on a pink dress and a gray suit jacket. And I'm going to take extra time to talk about uh, to help with accessibility, just the pictures that are on the slides. And we'll try to speak slower, but I have to admit I speak really fast. Um, so, but I'm glad that we have um, uh, the translation for what I am saying. So this is a picture of the Healthy People 23 initiative. On the right, I have a picture of the social determinants of health model, which is what is currently used. And on the left, I have uh, an explanation of each particular area, including education, health and healthcare, neighborhood and built environment, social and community context, and economic stability. And so when we look at this model, even though we know discrimination plays a key component, and limiting people's access to social factors that could help them thrive, we do not see it in this model. It is couched under the social and community context. And so for me, there was a key failure to connect discrimination as a root cause. And this is why I created my own model, which I will show you later. But I think it is imperative for us as public health professionals researchers, officials, as well as healthcare providers to really explicitly pull out discrimination that limits people's ability to be healthy. And this is what I do in my revised model, which is listed 
um, in a U.S. Department of Health and Human Services environmental scan on tools um, and social de uh, determinants of health models. So on the screen is my model, which shows the root cause, which is structural discrimination. Today, I'm going to talk about racism in particular, knowing that there is ableism, sexism, classism, that is all a part of structural discrimination. Law is a tool, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I based my model in part on social um, social epidemiologists who talk about systems, not just factors, but really systems that impact uh, the ways that we go about our daily lives. Um, and then that is connected to health and well-being. So what I've done in the in this picture, which shows public health and healthcare as a system, neighborhood and built environment education and economic stability is really pull in public health because as we saw during COVID, public health is a system that impacts people's lives. And so I've grouped that together with healthcare and I've sort of put together social and community context under neighborhood and built environment that includes voting, that includes issues along with uh, police, but really trying to harness the ways that we think about drivers differently, that it is systems that impact us. Now, why have the pink um, around those systems? Because that's what we currently focus on, right? We delve really deeply into systems, but not the root causes and the tools that shape these systems in a discriminatory way. And so for me, what I am going to focus on pretty much for the rest of my talk is the root cause, structural racism, and how law is a tool which structures systems in a discriminatory way. And I'm gonna focus on economic stability and in particular on the ways that employment is an issue. And so you may be wondering how is law a tool for structural discrimination? So let me give you an example that I'm sure most of you are aware of. So the Supreme Court case, uh, the Students for Fair Admissions v. Harvard, overturned the use of race in college admissions to attain diversity in college, which the Supreme Court said was a compelling interest 35 years ago. The court did this because it's claimed that it benefited some racial and ethnic minority individuals while it harmed white and Asian individuals. Yet it left in place legacy policies that harm and were adopted to discriminate against racial and ethnic minorities, particularly Catholic, Jewish, immigrants, as well as Asian, Black, and Latino individuals. Studies show that Harvard College um, in terms of legacy, 70% of legacy applicants with family ties to donors are alums are white, and they are about six times more likely to be admitted than other applicants. And in 2019, legacies made up nearly 28% of the admitted class. So how is that an example? The Supreme Court had an opportunity to address not only affirmative action, which was put in place to address historical and modern day harms of racial discrimination. They overturned that, but left in place legacy policies that advantage whites over racial and ethnic minority students. So we have structured college admissions in a way that advantages white individuals who are wealthy, not all, right, and disadvantage racial and ethnic minorities. That's the way that the law continues to structure our systems in ways that is discriminatory. Public health, we need to be explicit about these root causes so that when people challenge health equity, when people challenge the things that we are trying to do to eliminate this discrimination, they're quite clear about why we are doing that and why we are trying to do it so that we can make the constitutional guarantees of equality true for everyone. So structural discrimination is the power used by dominant groups to organize systems that provide life-sustaining resources in a manner which prioritizes their needs, protects their rights, values their beliefs, and helps them thrive 
and prosper and sustains their power. So you might be wondering, what do I mean by a dominant group? It depends. It depends on what area of focus you are looking at at that particular time. And so that's why I've included this diagram of intersectionality. It was created by Dr. Greta Bauer. She was doing it based off in part Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw's work of intersectionality, which was really speaking to what my talk is gonna be about today, which is Black women in employment and the intersection of discrimination that they face, which the law could not handle. And so this, Dr. Greta Bauer, built this off of her experiences in Canada, but it applies to uh, the discussion I will have today. Now, I am just gonna focus on race, ethnicity, and gender, but if we turn the wheel, we can see how the dominant group changes. It could be an able-bodied person. It could be an individual who has money. It could be an individual who is a native English speaker, right? And so when we think about discrimination and how how to address it, we have to understand the power dynamics and try to help the people who are in the disadvantaged group. Structurally racist systems provide life-sustaining resources in a manner which ignores the needs violates the rights, devalues the beliefs, and limits the power of racial and ethnic minority individuals. And we can see this again in structurally sexist systems and structurally ableist systems that ignore the needs, violates the rights, devalues the beliefs, and limits the power of individuals with disability or individuals who are gender minorities. And so you might be wondering, well, what's an example? I'm always up for giving people an example because sometimes you're like, well, we don't don't do that, but we do, right? So this is on the left of the slide is a copy of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which was passed to address discrimination, uh, both in healthcare and education. So it was one of the things that the Supreme Court talked about in the Students for Fair Admissions case. I'm gonna apply it to healthcare. And why I have it on the left next to the recent study that came out is that it says we are not supposed to discriminate based on race. But what we see in our healthcare systems is discrimination based on race. And unfortunately, that's allowable because the federal government decided in its interpretation of Title VI that it did not initially apply to healthcare providers. So what does that mean? That healthcare providers can legally discriminate against racial and ethnic minorities. Does it make sense? Does it? No, it does not. Uh, when we have section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, it has seemingly been interpreted to ban that discrimination, but in practice, what we tend to see is Black patients still getting less care than white patients. And so what this study does for me is it shows within the same healthcare system that the that they're ignoring the medical needs of racial and ethnic minority patients, they're violating their rights, they're devaluing their requests for pain medication and limiting their power, uh, particularly when it comes to access to opiates. Now, why is this the case? And that's a different lecture, but I'm going to spend about one minute telling you why. It's because we train people to believe that somehow Blacks and whites are different when it comes to pain. Uh, we believe that Black people don't have the same level of pain as white people. I have no idea why. Um, but we also teach people that Black people seeking pain medication are drug users, right? And so it's no wonder to think why people do not provide the same level of access to healthcare to Black patients when it comes to pain compared to whites. But why is that important for us in public health? Because we don't talk about it. We just talk about the disparities without centering the discrimination that is happening that is leading to these inequities in healthcare. So let me define for you structural racism, 
Um, and then I'm going to couch it in the terms of legal doctrine. Uh, so structural racism to me is the ways that laws, policies, and practices are used to structure systems to advantage white individuals and disadvantage racial and ethnic minority individuals. And so I am centering law, understanding that others look at the interplay between systems, but one of the key things is to highlight the ways that laws, practices, policies, these institutions and organizations create these uh, differences in systems. We often in public health talk about institutional racism and that's separate because to me, structural racism is a way that organizations work together to adopt policies and practices that may seem neutral, but in fact, disadvantage groups. And we often tend to say racism or races in terms of individuals and bad intent. And what I am trying to get across is that this this is just the default of the system. You could be the nicest person in the world, but our systems by default are discriminatory. And so if we don't counteract that, we are going to get bad outcomes. Now, the courts have created two uh, distinct forms of discrimination. And I know there's a lot on this slide, but I wanted to sort of connect the ways that structural racism is an example of legally prohibited racial discrimination. And some in public health say, well, no, you're taking this broad concept that we have and making it, it, making it less. No, what I am doing is taking this broad concept that you have, keeping it broad and saying that what people are doing is illegal. So when we think about disparate treatment, that's when we think about you're denying people the same opportunities because of their racial and ethnic background. And that's what we do when we structure our systems in a way that disadvantages people of color, racial and ethnic minorities. Disparate impact is when neutral policies have a disproportionate impact on individuals, and that is when organizations adopt neutral policies that that result in disparities and inequities. So let me give you an example uh, because you might be wondering, oh, we can't do this. Yes, we do. So the 14th Amendment was passed in, uh, was ratified in 1868. And so that is on the left, the discussion of the 14th Amendment that says due process of law, equal protection of the laws. On the right are the Black Code laws that were enacted in 1865 and remained on the books even after the ratification of the 14th Amendment. And what those are, are laws that limit Black individuals' ability to work in various arenas, right? So it limited Black individuals to working in hmm, agriculture, housekeeping, and service. Sounds like a reproduction of slavery, doesn't it? Yes. But on the books, we had the 14th Amendment. But the federal, the federal laws and courts allowed states to pass these laws and implement those and prevent Black Americans from being able to work outside of these arenas. This is an example of structural racism because it is a policy that structures the employment system in a way that advantages white employers who can keep their slaves, right, in these fields and disadvantages Black workers. And just in case you were like, oh, well, then the Black people could go work someplace else. No, because we have on the books the 13th Amendment, which says you can uh, do slavery as a form of punishment. So if Black workers violated these Black code laws or did not comply with the contracts that their white employers had, then they were what? They were put in jail and then put back into slavery. Okay, so this is an example of how our laws do not effectuate equality, that our default of our systems are structural racism. So in case you thought that those laws were owed, I'm gonna give you some examples of continuing laws that continue to structure the system in a discriminatory way. And so on my right, I have my model up again, showing the root cause. And so what I'm gonna do is go through uh, really economic stability. I'm gonna give you an example of the laws 
that promise equality, show you an example of how that doesn't work in terms of employment, give you a reason why that's structural racism, and then provide a little bit of information about health inequities. At the end, I'm gonna talk about the ways that public health unfortunately reinforces some of these issues, and then I'm gonna end with health justice. So I'm gonna talk about hiring and pay, I'm gonna talk about racial and ethnic minorities, and then go on to talk about women. And so what I have up on the slide right now is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, particularly the employment practices section that goes into failure to or refuse to hire and to limit, segregate, or classify employees. I'm really going to focus on the hiring aspect of it. And what I have now is showing a story from the New York Times that is very recent, April 8th, 2024, where researchers from the National Bureau of Economic uh, Research um, just did a study sending out resumes to the top um, companies and saw that many of the companies discriminated against Black applicants. So I'm going to list some of the employees, um, employers, but please go check out the study and uh, the New York Times article. So that includes, and I'm doing it in order of sort of the, the company that was found to uh, to discriminate against Black applicants the most was Builders First, LKO Auto, JP Morgan Chase, Honeywell, CVS, Goodyear, Auto Nation, UGI, Target, West Rock, Costco, and many more. And what they found is that on average, employers contacted the presumed white applicants about 9.5% more often than presumed Black applicants. That might not seem a whole lot, but that was them across about 100 different employers. And what they did was send out resumes. They just changed the names. That's it. And what they found, again, was that there was a presumption of more of calling back more of the white applicants versus the black applicants. The practice varied by firm and industry. Um, in fact, many of the worst um, in terms of industries were retailers or car dealers. Um, that Auto Nation, a used car retail retailer, which contacted presumed white applicants 43% more often, 43% more often, even though the resumes were the same. They found that the callbacks in terms of who was called back more often, that it was white women, white men, black men, and then black women uh, the least. And so I show this to you because remember, we have a law that says you are supposed to treat everybody equally, right? And we're supposed to use uh, your qualifications equally. And yet we are seeing that that is not the case. Research shows that approximately half of all jobs are filled through referrals. Women of color were less, were 35% less likely, men of color 26% less likely, and white women were 12% less likely. Um, and studies show that nearly 33% of all interviews are due to referrals, which increases the likelihood of a job offer, and it also increases the starting salary. And so what are we doing when we're using referrals? We are not getting the most qualified person. What are we doing? We are getting people who have broad social contacts, who are connected with the people at the job, and that's how we seek out people. But that is not facilitating equality. And we need to be clear about that when we are using referrals for a job. Studies also show, and I'm just building on the research around uh, resumes, that Black individuals with non-white sounding names are like uh, Lakeisha received 50 percent fewer callbacks than Black individuals with white sounding names. If Black applicants whitened their resumes, then they increased their uh, callback rate by 26%. Again, not connected to qualifications, connected to what? Our bias against people. Studies also show that resumes submitted for high skill jobs with women's names received half the number of callbacks as resumes with men's names, 
even though the resumes had the same qualifications. And so to me, this is an example of structural racism and structural sexism, because we are allowing employers to use referral policies that are neutral in a way that disadvantages individuals who are women, gender minorities, um, and individuals who are racial and ethnic minorities. It is not using your pool or your power to get the most qualified applicant. Uh, and the government has either failed to enforce the laws or enforce them to protect the rights of the dominant group, meaning they are continuing to allow referrals, even though we have research that shows that it does not lead to equality. And the same thing in terms of people getting callbacks on uh, based on the sound of their name. I'm gonna shift now um, to talking about pay, but there's lots of research that this happens in a way where Black individuals are um, steered into lower uh, paying jobs. And so there's other research out there that talks about individuals just showing up for jobs um, and the white and Latino applicants being interviewed, the Black applicants being told, you know, we need to check your references before we can interview or be being steered to a lower paying job. And we see this also in tech companies. And you could see, I could talk about this for a while, but I'm gonna move on to pay. And so I am showing on the screen the Title VII again, but I've highlighted the part that talks about you're not supposed to discriminate against an individual with respect to his compensation. And I do want to highlight here, um, just for us in this, it's very interesting how they use his and not they or broader language, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Um, and I want to now on the screen, I do have an Equal Pay Act of 19 so we have Title VII, which is supposed to prevent racial discrimination in terms of pay and gender, but we also have the Equal Pay Act, which is um, supposed to prevent discrimination based on gender in wages. The problem with this act, though, is that it only compares people across racial groups. So a Black woman working in a job under the Equal Pay Act will only be compared to a Black man doing the job. So her pay could only go up that far, but we know the Black man is not the one who's making the most. So even if she's doing the same level of work as a white man, if she brings a case under the Equal Protection Act, they're not going to move her pay up to the level of a white man. And we could talk about why somebody would bring an action under the Equal Pay Act versus Title VII another time, but I did want to highlight that for you. So on the screen and the next few slides that I have are really trying to show um, through pictures how this disparity looks. And so this is data from the Institute for Women's Policy Research which includes the median weekly earnings. And so that's not the average, that's just uh, the, me the middle number. Um, and it compares gender earnings ratio for, uh, ratio for full-time workers by race and ethnicity. And so on the first um, column, we see women's median we weekly earnings. Um, on the leftmost column, they show all races, Asian, Black, Hispanic, White, and this is from 2003. And so you could see white is the uh, is the second highest, right? And so I do want to just take a second and an asterisk here. Public health, we often use white as the standard when it's not always the standard. And so we should stop doing that. Okay, back to my originally <laughs> scheduled talk. When you look at Asians, um, they actually have the highest uh, women's medium weekly earnings at almost 1300. Um, the men's medium weekly earnings is 1600, right? And so we see a difference there. Uh, for black, uh, black women, it's $889. For black men, $970. And so you could really see the impact here. If we're using the Equal Pay Act, the black woman is only going to get up to $900, uh, $970 when she may be doing the same work as the Asian man who is getting paid $1,600. 
Um, the next slide shows that the gender uh, wage gap persists at all parts of the wage distribution. So it's low wage, middle wage, high wage, right? That there is a difference between men and women. And this shows, I'm gonna focus in on the low wage that uh, there is a disparity of about almost $2. Uh, whereas when we get to high wage, the disparity is almost is $15, right? And can be very key in these times of inflation. Most people, People in public health try to argue, well, if you just get more education, we'll eliminate some of this problem. Nope, does not work. Actually, what the research shows is sometimes that women are often out-earned by men with less education, and the gender gap uh, grows as women enter prime working years, and I'm going to tell you why. And so this picture shows right, in terms of high school, that men who have high school diploma earn $24, whereas women who have earned a high school employee, uh, high school degree, make about $19. We see the biggest gap um, in terms of disparity, really at the um, low education level, but it, there is still a big disparity when uh, we look at advanced degree. And disproportionately, Black and Hispanic women experience the largest pay gap. So this is, and all these, uh, the last three figures come from the Economic Policy Institute, where we show the wage penalty uh, between uh, Black women, Latino women, and their counterparts, as well as Asian Pacific Islander. There was another uh, great photo, but it's a little outdated, where you can actually even compare between white women and Black women, and you see you still see Black women earning less, even though they were working more hours than the white women. So lots of disparities there. And so why is this an example of structural racism, structural sexism? Because organizations and institutions use prior salary history as a way to determine people's salary. Again, not linked to skill, job responsibility, or job qualifications. And what tends to happen is that women, women of color, enter the job market, start off at a lower paying salary, and that follows them throughout their career. And think about it, why are we using prior salary history to decide somebody's pay anyway? We know how much we should be paying the person. Let's not ask about what their prior salary is because that really does not go to the language we said in the law, which says pay people the same if they have the same skill, job responsibility and duties, and we are not doing that. Well, guess what? That's legal. Many courts have said that it is okay to use prior salary history to pay people less, even though they are doing the same job, have the same skill and the same job responsibility. Do you see how that is structuring the system in a discriminatory way? It's a default. So I don't even need to think about it. I just default into this system, which is problematic. So let's talk about the health inequities that are connected with that. There's not a lot of literature on there on this. So if you are a public health student and want to do this research, great. I would love that. The research that we have is really looking at some depressive system uh, symptoms and some connection to infant mortality. So a 2023 study showed a connection between gender bias and employment and older women's depressive risk. Um, and in fact, on average, they said about 32% of the gender uh, sorry depression gap can be explained by unequal opportunities in the labor market. And when we equalize employment status, occupation, and prior income, uh, we see this gender depression gap uh, disappearing. Um, the, these mental health inequities were highest for Latina and Black women. Uh, which is key for us. Well-educated Black women reported having more financial pressures and fewer economic opportunities than white women, which is significantly associated with higher rates of infant mortality for Black women. Um, and experiencing discrimination at work has been associated with higher job stress, post-traumatic stress symptoms for Black women, 
And there's a positive correlation between anticipated uh, prejudice, increased uh, psychological and cardi cardiovascular stress among Latinas. So in summary, all righty. Um, let me see if I could get rid of the shopping. <laughs> All right. Um, so in summary, what did we learn? We learned that structural discrimination disadvantages a whole host of people. And I'm going to stop here. Um, it, under the law, it is legal to pay individuals with disability a poverty wage. You can pay individuals with disabilities $2 an hour where you are required to pay an individual who is able-bodied $18. That's just discriminatory in all realms. Um, so I wanted to highlight that it's not just women, gender minorities, and racial and ethnic minorities. It is multiple groups. And we need to change these laws and policies to ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity to thrive. I focused on women and racial and ethnic minority workers, but so many people are impacted and has been associated with health inequities and well-being for these groups. So how does public health play a role? Oftentimes when we think about interventions, we focus on individual solutions, which we are not supposed to be doing because remember we're population-based, but we do. So Healthy People 2030, one of the solutions for addressing employment health inequities is increasing employment and working age people by providing career counseling, jobs, and educational opportunities. And hopefully now that you were paying attention to my slides, you know, career counseling does what? If you're sending in a resume and they see your name, you're not getting a job, right? If we're talking about educational opportunities, I've just showed you how women who have more education than men are still getting paid less than men. And when we're talking about jobs, I didn't have time to go into it, but it also, we see bias in terms of promotions, evaluations, and don't think that implementing merit systems work. Because when you implement merit systems, it actually increases the gender gap in pay. So all of these things that we are talking about doing in public health to address inequities in employment are not going to work. Why? Because we are not addressing the root cause, which is discrimination. And so studies have shown in 2018, a study found that Black job seekers were penalized for trying to negotiate equal or higher salaries than white counterparts. They were expected to negotiate less and they were penalized if they tried to negotiate equal. So I'm sure you've heard Oh, if you just negotiate for your salary, that's works. It does not. You are actually harming people because if you're telling people to negotiate for the same, they might actually get less than what they are supposed to get. A 2006 study also found that male and female evaluate, evaluators were less inclined to work with female candidates that initiated salary negotiations. Stop telling people to negotiate better fix the discrimination that is causing people to be paid less for doing the same work. And quite honestly, we are all clear that we are not doing the same amount of work. We are doing more work. So we actually need to negotiate and pay people for the work that they are doing, right? The all tax of women doing more service and people of color doing diversity work and doing more work, but getting less pay. So in public health, we cannot continue to say, oh, just do these individual solutions that will help. It's it's not going to help and it's actually going to make things worse. So when we talk about health equity, and I know our focus is on health equity, I'm trying to push us and transform us to think about health justice. So this at the top of the slide is the definition of health equity, which begins to focus on broader conceptions that we've had in the past, right? To look at the health of all people. And we've had some movement, which is nice to talk about historical and contemporary injustices. But 
The Supreme Court doesn't understand what an injustice is, even as they create more injustice. So we need to be specific about what we mean. We mean discrimination. We mean structural discrimination. We mean when we set up our systems in a way that it is legal to discriminate against people because they are different. We cannot continue to do that. And so we must be clear about what we are trying to do in public health and say it and say it loud. So this again is my revised social determinants of health model, but I put it here because it shows the areas that I'm gonna focus on in terms of health justice. There are three particular principles, truth and reconciliation, which goes to our root cause of structural discrimination, community-driven change and structural change, which goes to the changes in laws, policies, practices, the political determinants of health. I hope you've heard about that from Daniel Dawes, right? All of that is encompassed in law and then financial and institutional support. So what do I mean by that? So, when we think about the truth uh, and reconciliation process, it acknowledges the existence of structural discrimination, structural racism, and provides a mechanism for overcoming trauma. And I'm going to talk about each of these separately in more detail. Impact of communities, particularly racial and ethnic minority communities, when we're talking about structural racism, must drive, lead the creation, implementation, and valuation of any right to healthcare and any change that we're going to have. And a right, um, and when we think about these changes in public health, we must also provide financial supports and accommodations that repair the harm. And so when I, when I, uh, I'm doing this work on health justice. I'm working along with professors Lindsay Wiley, Seema Moapatra, Dean Brietta Clark, and Professor uh, Emily Benfer. And we have been trying to build on the amazing work that scholars have been doing around reproductive justice, the environmental justice movements, the civil rights movements, the whole power movements during the 60s and 70s of really expanding our thoughts about what people need and their right to have it to thrive. And so when I talk about truth and reconciliation, um, the government must admit that it has not enforced the employment laws, right? Speaking to the examples that I gave, that women and racial and ethnic minority individuals, individuals with disability, gender minorities, LGBTQIA, plus those individuals in poverty should have the opportunity to share their experiences of what it has been like to work in places that are not built for them. Um, and those experiences should become part of the record of the government. That's the lawyer and me, so that we are clear and understand our history. So as we go through these cases, courts can't say, well, there's no discrimination. No, we see that there is discrimination and we must take affirmative steps to address those problems. The social determinants of health work must be tied to legal requirements of equality. We often talk about the social determinants of health as a good. And what people misunderstand is that they think that you are doing something out of the kindness of your heart, which I'm sure you are, but that really is tied to equality and to the past harms and current day harms that we are doing. It is not giving an advantage over one group over another, what it's trying to do is provide the things that every group needs. And some groups need more because they have been harmed more. Um, and include measurable goals for eliminating some of these problems, particularly in terms of hiring and pay. Because if we don't provide measurable goals, we'll never know if we are making any progress. Um, and hopefully not telling people, oh, just go out and negotiate better. Um, particularly when we talk about racism as a public health crisis, right? This was a shiny moment, I think, for some of us in public health to begin to be able to say racism out in public and to call it a public health crisis. But the problem is how have we actually connected that to the interventions that we are trying to adopt? Many governments have talked about the fact that they're going to give perhaps 
uh, reparations in Evanston, Illinois. They've talked about giving reparations to Black individuals for the harm, but we must do so by explicitly talking about the things that we did that caused the harm so that when future generations come back, they can understand and we can see if there's been any change that will allow us to forego some of these attacks that we see around health equity. So let me give you some specific steps if you were wondering what can we do? We need to add structural discrimination to risk factors for health inequities. I say we need to stop shortchanging and using race as a proxy for discrimination, that we need to explicitly say it and try to capture information that will support uh, the ways that we have all been impacted by structural discrimination. We need to collect data regarding structural discrimination. We tend to ask people about their experiences with discrimination, but not then also connect that with the structures of the employment system that tend to lead to their individual experiences. We need to fund uh, and research the impact of structural discrimination. We need to adopt a model that specifically puts in structural discrimination as a root cause and acknowledge that racial and ethnic minority individuals continue to be blamed um, incorrectly for poor health outcomes. We tend to look at individuals who don't do well and try to train them to do better. But training the victim on how to, to thrive in a racist system is not the ways that we should be moving. We should be actually working to change the system. We need community-driven change. We need racial and ethnic minorities to lead this change, right? So if we're thinking about adopting a law, uh, addressing racism as a public health crisis, guess who should not be making that law by themselves? The government and public health officials. It should be the people who are harmed who are leading the discussions about what they need um, and the repair that they want. I forgot to mention in terms of the truth and reconciliation process, we need reparative work. Right. And so that process should be governmental officials listening, not talking, listening, and then providing whatever support individuals who have suffered, whatever they need. Right. It's not going to be just therapy and it's not going to end just right away. We need to give those resources. And what that will do is to build a trusting relationship with government and those groups who they have discriminated against. Uh, we must focus on structural level change, not just lifestyle and behavioral changes. It really must be changing our systems and focusing on what we need to do. And we need to provide financial supports. I don't know if you know this, but historically we have given reparations out to slave owners. Okay, so reparations is not something that we haven't done in the past. Actually, after the Civil War, we gave money to slave owners for the loss of their slaves. We never gave money or support to the slaves. During Jim Crow, we have not given reparations to people who were not able to buy houses, who are not able to be employed equally. Uh, we haven't done that to individuals with disabilities. We have done it to some extent for Japanese Americans who were put in camps, uh, but not enough. And so when people try to say, oh, well, we shouldn't do reparations. Yes, we should, because we have given reparations to everybody who has benefited from discrimination, but not those who are victims. That reparation should not just be a one-time payment. It should be guaranteed basic income, free health insurance, savings accounts, down payments for housing, retirement funds. And if you think I'm just focused on racial and ethnic minorities, I'm not. We need to give reparations to individuals who have disabilities, to gender minorities, to people in poverty. We need to give reparations to the people who have been harmed by discrimination. So with that, I am going to end and I look forward to lots of questions. These slides just show some of the additional readings that I'm basing my talk off of. And I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. 
uh, the people here in person and the people online. And my hope is that we will work towards health justice, but that means we have to actively counter discrimination and speak truth to power. Our systems are not fair and we need to stop acting like they are and really work to help everybody in this country have an opportunity for equal equality and to thrive. Thank you. Questions from the audience. Oh, yes. I can say I'm not sure. I've read the paper. It is a beautiful paper. It's economic paper and it has lots of um, lots of formulas and lots of discussion about stats. So for people who have that background, please read the paper and translate it to me. It is beautiful though. They talk about they're using two models. They're trying to see if their model actually works. So yes, please review the paper. I do not think they did machine learning, but they did talk about how they sent out resumes before COVID and after COVID and then had to um and then had to try to standardize it as well. So I don't think it they were uh focused on machine learning, but I'm gonna answer a question you didn't ask. Uh, what was interesting is they did look at people who were federal contractors and people who were not, and they found that federal contractors you think would be better in upholding the dictates of equality, and what they found is they were not. Um, and so I think we need to think about that as well as thinking about machine learning and how that can replicate bias. Yeah. Yeah, so that is a beautiful question. And I'm going to try to rein in my answer. Um, and so the question was, yes, I was just about to. Thank you for that. And so the question was, um, how can we pull in this information to be in the public worker, particularly for these governmental agencies that are overseeing um, our civil rights laws? Did I get that? Um, and so... Let me tell you a little bit more. So the Equal Opportunity uh, Commission doesn't have that much power. That was intentional. Um, the Title VII of the uh, Civil Rights Act seemingly gave broad powers to address employment discrimination. And then we have limited the EEOC's power to address it. And so what tends to happen is that if you bring a case under Title VII, you have to go to the EEOC first to, and they'll review the data and say, well, we think you have a case. But guess what? That is not binding. So then what you have to do is you get a certification, then you go to the courts to then now sue who could decide that they don't agree with the EOC's determination. Who is going to do that, right? If you are a person who has faced discrimination, you are going to have the money and the time to go through that process, then go through the court process. And remember, you might not even have all the information you need to be able to sue because none of that information is public. So you're just guessing that you are paid less than somebody. You're going to court and that's how you get the information. It is not a great system because we have set up the enforcement of civil rights, civil rights laws and equality and put the burden on the individual 
to then prove it. And they have to take a long time. Now, I told you equal, the Equal Pay Act, it's nice because you don't have to go through that process. You could go directly to court, but then what you lose is the capacity to get the full pay that you are seeking. Furthermore, I'll just add this, you didn't ask, but I'm adding it, is that the person who brings a lawsuit is considered uh, gets a bad reputation. So usually it's not the company that gets a bad reputation. It's the person who brings the lawsuit who could win and probably can win, but still then does not have the opportunity to work. And so our systems don't work. So yes, you know about the EEOC now, um, but their, de their, um, their decisions are not necessarily binding. And so you as an individual still can suffer some harm for bringing these cases. Um, and I can tell you, as an example, I have suffered the same thing where I was getting paid less than I should have. I actually have a letter from the provost saying that they were paying me less than they should have, but they were not gonna pay me equally because I left. I could have sued, did I? No. But that's how dysfunctional our systems are, that even if you have a letter saying that we were paying you less than we should have, you still probably will not recuperate. So thank you. Yeah, so I, your question is beautiful and I'm not gonna be able to capture everything you just said and repeating it. Uh, but uh, the question is, uh, we have individuals from these communities, right? Racial and ethnic minority individuals who are trying to work with uh, patients and mothers to address this racism and they're facing their own discrimination in this system. And so that's why to me, it is so key for us in public health and healthcare to talk about discrimination up front and to fund the people who are working in this space at a living wage, right? Not minimum wage, but at a living wage, because we understand that to change the system, we need people working in the system who are doing this work, who then will help the people who are suffering, right? So for me, community health workers, doulas, right? They need to be paying at a living wage and it's not based on grant funding, it is the they are a part of the team. They're recognized that they we are paying for that under Medicaid, under all of our grants, right? That they are sustainable. We pay them at a living wage to then go help the people that they are trying to help. And guess what? 
they're having babies too. They're having depression too. And so if you start giving a living wage to them, you will hopefully start to help addressing these health inequities. Because it's not just the patients, it's the people working in public health, community health, who are also facing this stress because they are not getting paid a living wage. They don't have paid sick leave. They don't have time off, right? And so if we really understood that and public health, we would set up the public health system so that everybody can make a living wage. And I know I'm saying that and there's no funding for public health, but that's why we go say we need funding in public health, not to just address COVID, but to sustain the people who are doing this work so their health will be just as uh, raised up and thriving, just as the people they're trying to help. So thank you. Well, I just want to thank you so much for such an insightful uh, lecture with so much vocabulary that we're learning as a program in population health and health equity. And so you, you've charged us here to really step our game up. And so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so before we leave and enjoy some refreshments next door, um, I just want to say that this is the first time we combined uh, two celebrations, both our 20th anniversary of our uh, master's in public health program, as well as our uh, 10th anniversary of our Renee Rex Shaler. And I just wanted to briefly bring your attention to the back of the program. Normally, when we kind of have these separate, uh, we have Dr. Magaziner giving some remarks, and, and we also share a bit about uh, Dr. Renee Rex Shaler, which I'll have you read, because I know we're uh, totally behind on our time. But um, I just wanted to say uh, that, you know, Dr. Uh, Rex Shaler was one of the first faculty here that invited me in to her laboratory and her group as a new assistant professor who was really trying to get her breast cancer basic science lab off the ground. And she brought me into her work, which was um, looking at African-American women and prevention of breast cancer. And so for that, I am so, so grateful. And I also wanted to recognize the family uh, who's here. I don't know if you want to stand up to everybody. <laughs> I had to put you on the spot. Uh, this is Magda, uh, her daughter, who, who comes out every year um, to support us. And, and we thank you so much uh, for what what you've done for our our lecture series and for us this um, would not have been possible, as well as uh, recommending our lecture today. So, um, and also thank you for the organizers. I know Aaron's been running around doing a little bit of everything and how this you know, materialized and came in place. Uh, Dr. St. George, I see her in the back. I know she's happy that she's sitting down now. But, um, and I just wanna thank you all for coming and spending half a day with us uh, in these celebrations that we are so uh, grateful to share with you. And we are looking forward to many more to come. And so I don't know if my colleague has anything to say. We have some refreshments that are out at the atrium that we hope you will enjoy. Uh, oh, out here. Oh, no, sorry, not the atrium. Right out here in this area. So it's a little bit of a shorter walk. So but I know. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you again, everyone, uh, for such a wonderful program. And... Have a wonderful evening.